Welcome to Life from Plato's Cave. I am Mario Veen. In Plato's Cave, the prisoners start out being limited to only one perspective, one way to look at life. But they turn around and go on a journey where they encounter images that challenge what they have always believed about who they are and how the world works. In this episode, we will look at the way we can look at the world from different angles. We will discuss how art can not only help us do that, but is in fact necessary and urgent. Our guide today is Mika Ball. I am fascinated by her approach to education, research and teaching. Mika started as a literary scholar. Her commitment is to interdisciplinary approaches to cultural artifacts and their potential effects. She focuses on gender, migratory culture, psychoanalysis and the critique of capitalism. Mika has had a long academic career and supervised 80 PhDs with the 81st currently on the way. She published over 40 books and curated many exhibitions. This year she has new books coming out, including a book called Image Thinking, a term that she coined and which we will discuss later on. What makes Mika unique in my view is that she did not just limit herself to teaching, research and theoretical development. She co-made documentaries about migratory culture video installations and films, which she calls theoretical fictions. Many of these are exhibited as video installations in museums all over the world. For instance, A Long History of Madness argues for a more humane treatment of psychosis and was exhibited in a site-specific version, saying it, in the Freud Museum in London. Madame B was combined with paintings by Edward Munch in the Munch Museum in Oslo. Her latest film, It's About Time, Reflections on Urgency, was produced in Poland in 2020, just before the corona pandemic. It's a short film and you can watch it in full on Mika's website. I will provide the link in the description. I visited her film and her video installations in the Museum Jan Kuhne in Os, in our exhibition which was called Art Out of Necessity. But unfortunately this exhibition had to be cut short because of the corona measures in the Netherlands. That's really a shame and I hope it will be repeated there or in another venue. So Mika, thank you for joining me here. A pleasure, Mario. Thank you for inviting me. I think I could spend the entire episode just reading your CV. <laughs> but let's not do that. People can find yeah. that on your site. So I'd like to start with an impossible question, perhaps. If you, out of all the books and films you made and uh, the other work that you've done, if you had to pick one that is closest to your heart, which would it be? That is an impossible question indeed, because each work I make, book or film or exhibition, at the moment that I do it, I'm completely involved in it and it is close to my heart. And I don't find it, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say that I regret certain books. There are books that I am less interested in now, but to say which is my favorite is a bit difficult. The favorite is always the next one. So the one that's coming out this year on image thinking is now my uh, total uh, obsession and my favorite. Okay, so in that sense, yes. But I don't know what comes after and I'll have different views later. Okay, so... We will speak later. I'd like to speak with you about how we might use art uh, to think about and be in dialogue with the world using maybe uh, image thinking. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, I'd like to share how I met you and with a little uh, history of myself. When I graduated from high school, in the, in the last year, you have to think about what do you want to study. But the, I, find, I found it very hard. So I was interested in physics, but... If I studied physics, I couldn't study psychology. And if I studied psychology, I couldn't study sociology. So somebody told me, what if you did this, it was called University College Utrecht, you can postpone your decision. So I thought, okay, I'll go there because I can study different subjects. And then after three years uh, doing that, I'll figure out what I want to do. So I did my bachelor there and I really love this college because you can, do you know it? I know of it and I know someone who works there. Okay, yeah. So 
it's it's like an American model, but but I could study sociology, physics, politics, philosophy, statistics, and you can choose each of these subjects. Do you do like an, a beginner level or do you go on in that? So I did that, and then but then <laughs> after my third year, uh, I still didn't figure out what I wanted to do. I, I really got into philosophy there, but if I did that, yeah, I would miss out on the political side or other sides. So. Then came the master program that you founded called Cultural Analysis at the Amsterdam University. At that time, I, I had no idea that uh, this existed, an approach like that to uh, studying in academia. So I want to thank you because it showed me that I didn't have to limit myself to one discipline. It's because you have an open mind, and that is exactly the kind of minds that we need more in this world. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, that that is the I think for me is the challenge with being open and still, if I'm open all day, I'm having a great time, but I don't produce anything, and being systematic. So that was also kind of the structure of that that study was being in a classroom with with people from literary studies, filmmakers, uh, curators, uh, people who worked in media and concentrating on, on a common subject, a common uh, object. But so, so for me, it was a difference from, let's say, in, in high school, uh, monodisciplinarity. So just, OK, I have to do physics or I have to do uh, computer science. And then in the university college, maybe multidisciplinary. So I had all these different subjects. I went from one hour to the next, but if I had first philosophy and then statistics, they didn't really appreciate it if I brought up something about philosophy in the statistics class. <laughs> oh. And then <laughs> the interdisciplinary master cultural analysis. So that's something completely different, but could you maybe explain what, what that means, interdisciplinary? Yeah, that's a really a very crucial thing in my in my life, in my thinking and work is interdisciplinary as uh, something that it means inter means between. Right. That's the preposition. That's uh, it means relationship. So it's not that the uh, traditional disciplines are obsolete, that we should throw away that knowledge. No, that knowledge is precious. Every knowledge that exists and that's valid is precious and we should keep it. But coming from one discipline and moving into another field that's traditionally separated from it, as I have done from literature to art, art history, but I never studied art history, but I started to work on art. Um, you don't uh, dismiss the knowledge that's been built up in that other field. And also, uh, you don't want a degree in that field. So between indifference to the other field and um, the ambition to know it all, what I try to develop is ways in which you can establish a relationship where you take one thing from the one and another thing from the other and you weave them together. And that's how I have developed the notion of interdisciplinarity. I call it intership, with a hyphen between inter and ship, <laughs> as an attitude. Intership, like being in between maybe different worlds, yeah, different ways of looking. Yeah, and endorsing that and, and finding that exciting so that you feel constantly challenged, but you, you also feel that you're learning. And that learning, I think I have a sort of an addiction to learning, even now in my retirement, uh, officially, so to speak. Um, I, every day, if I don't learn something, I feel like the day was wasted. <laughs> and that can be small things or bigger things or new ideas, you know. And that mm. sort of inter going inter between the disciplines is a very uh, exciting way of, of learning. Yeah. Did you already learn something today? Uh, <laughs> yes, but that's a bit of a long story. <laughs> that takes the uh, pressure off me a little bit. Okay. Well, I, I was asked to write an article about an artist. And then when I saw her work, 
uh, in books, I found that I made a mistake to accept it because I didn't think I understood the work. And then today I got her uh, photos for the new exhibition for which I'm supposed to write. And it was much more uh, accessible and interesting and gripping. And so that's why I, uh, I feel that I learned something today. Oh, great. It reminds me of something that you that you say over and over again in your work that something like uh, a theory, but uh, we can speak about in academics about theory, but we have theories all day about I have an idea, let's say an informal theory. I think something is like this and this. Mm-hmm. And I think one attitude at least I have most of the time is to look if the world fits my theories or how I can make the world fit into my theories. But what you bring up a lot in your work is about terms like meaningful disagreement, um, close reading, where where something that you engage with, like a, a text, if you cite uh, you cite someone, you should not just cite it to prove your point, but actually maybe the citation, if you look at it again, it tells you something else. Yes, exactly. And that, that is what I find so important to... Uh, what I teach, which I don't officially do, but sometimes I do seminars and all that, but I've always found very important to help my students realize that it's not me who has the knowledge and they are stupid and they need to learn. They need to learn, but so do I. And I learn when I'm in dialogue with the students, but the object is the third partner. You have the theory, okay, theory, that's the fourth partner then. You have the theory, you have the uh, the dialogue between people, you have uh, the object, and uh, you have uh, the world. And the challenge is to bring those in dialogue, not to say this theory applies like this, like a grid, and then the answer is clear. No, the answer is is never quite so clear because the object is alive. It wasn't made for to fit the theory. So if the object doesn't fit the theory, I tell the students, then you learn. So that's good. But how do you know that the object doesn't fit theory? Well, you write and you come up with quotations. And then you tend to, it's very easy to fall into the trap to use the object as an illustration of your theory. And to take the quote, then you move on. So never do that. Never just move on. But take the quote again. Look at it in detail. Look at the object, whether it's a text or or an image or something else. And if the fit is not perfect, then look at those gaps where it doesn't fit. And then I think you learn. You come up with more complex ideas. Hmm. And I have now now an experience which I have a lot, which is uh, I have two thoughts in my head, which are completely different. Hmm. And... I have to choose if I if I I have to try to remember the other yeah. while I'll tell you the one, which is one thing I, I think your approach at least has helped me to do is to do justice to that and not to say, okay, I have to push one away. So um, I'll tell you the two thoughts if I remember the other one still. So one is that uh, this this is how I felt this was very different from philosophy because a group of people speaking in a room about things like time or, or madness or something like that. You could say, well, quickly say that's a philosophy, but what I found m- maybe not missing in philosophy because it's, it's its own discipline is that you can speak with uh, a group of people about what is real and what is not real. And you can speak endlessly and you can all agree with each other or disagree, but then what what you introduced in the in the cultural analysis is that there must be an object present there in some way, which yeah. could be a text or it could be a film or it could be something else. Yes, that is what is lacking in philosophy. Philosophers are more the the only object is the previous or other philosophers. They always comment on each other's work, which is fine, and I'm not dismissing philosophy, but I think there is a lack of um allowing an image or a text or something uh, outside a situation, some part of the world 
has to be part of the dialogue. And if not, then it can easily become a bit sterile, a bit, uh, you know, fruitless. Yeah. Why, why bother kind of feeling. Yeah, and someone like like Adorno, I think, would even say it could could be dangerous if you don't if you lose your touch with the world and you you stop listening to the world on how it disagrees with you, and you can build the perfect ideal system of how every how the world should be, but then you can exclude uh, everything that does not fit that image. Exactly, and Adorno <laughs> is a philosopher. That's a really yeah. good example of a philosopher who's always in touch with with the real world and with concrete things and yeah. and still he is a philosopher yeah i think i think he calls that like thinking against yourself or thinking against yeah. thinking yeah yeah the the other thought which may be related to this is that what you what you say about objects we could maybe also say about uh people that you meet in your life mm -hmm. uh, how to how how do you treat somebody do you say oh you are this person, uh, you have this identity, uh, you come from this country maybe, or you look like this, so this is what you must be like. No, no, that's, that's what we call at the exterior typing, if not plain racism or sexism or whatever. I think if you are going to make, to meet people, not as persons, but as a group or part of a group or, you know, you put them in a box and you say, you are that, then the dialogue is over or it has not even begun. I think it's really important that every meeting encounter with another person is based on um, an openness towards who they are and respect for their difference from what you expect or from your categories or you know this is the danger of categories is that it becomes boxes and you lock something in or someone and that's it they're fixed fixated and that is very dangerous yeah that's what that's one thing i learned also back then is that the the latin word qua which means as so instead of saying something for instance you could say painting is an image you don't you don't say uh, we we don't we we're going to argue if painting is an image or if it is uh, a, a text or something else we can rather speak about what happens if we see painting as image and then yeah. we say painting as text and then we can also speak about what is an image and a text and how do they relate to each other mm -hmm. You get this very nice constellation of uh, yeah something happening. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're totally right that uh, to say we will talk about this thing as a painting. And so you talk about the painterly sides of it. But then maybe there is something textual in it too. There is an argument some often in a painting. And you wouldn't see that if you didn't accept that that aspect is also important. So yes, it's. I think it's. It's a really. The, this, this is the danger of definitions. In my book, image thinking, I have refused to come up with any definition because that's. Don't give a good definition of image thinking. <laughs> no, that's an activity. It's not a something. Mm. It's an activity, an attitude, uh, an openness to what you can learn from making images and looking at images instead of uh, only studying uh, theoretical texts or historical texts. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has helped my, I have to say, I had already a lot of work behind me when I started to make films. And I never thought I would do that. I never intended to become an artist. I had no training in it, but also I was a scholar. And then one day, I, f I just stumbled into a situation where it was necessary to make a film in order to understand more and better what's happening around us in the contemporary world. And this was around uh, the so-called uh, sans papier, the illegal immigrants. Um, that uh, there was just a guy who was my neighbor, and he came and uh, you know he told me his life, and and we got friendly, and it became an inspiration. And I have to say that from making 
images, and this was just one beginning in 2002. From making images, I have learned so much in more depth, more comple complexity, more dialogue and more contemporaneity about the world than I had before from going to the library and reading books, which I also love to do. But it's never up to date. It's always sort of you on your own with it. Uh, and making films, you're never alone. Mm. And that changes everything. And there, there are many books in your films as well, like yeah. uh, Don Quixote reading books and maybe he's he looks like maybe he's going crazy or maybe he has a, has a brilliant idea. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the, Don Quixote is, is a classical case of uh, the, the, the so-called narrator says he became mad. He lost his wits because he was reading day and night. And that has become the stereotype of Don Quixote. But in fact, the guy is much smarter than uh, we think. Uh, you can also say he was reading to escape from the cruelty and the, and the misery in the world. And reading was for him an escape. And then when he goes out on his adventures, he falls into traps, he makes mistakes, but he is not a stupid you know, nobody. And the fact that the novel, if I may just continue a bit, that novel is completely without structure. It is you know, chapter after chapter, adventure after adventure. It's completely wild. No linearity, which is why I made no, I did not make a film. You mentioned this as a film, but I don't, did not make a film, but only an installation to, mm -hmm. uh, to be loyal to that sort of structureless uh, despair of this, this character. And I don't know that he went crazy, although in, in the video of the reading, he does become a little crazy. He starts to caress the book and uh, smell it. And in the end, he eats a page. He tears it off, eats it. And you see it, well, he swallows it, really. I mean, you see his Adam's apple move. I was scared when he did that. I wasn't prepared. But I think it's a total lovely way of saying the senses participate. It's never only intellectual uh, or literary. It's it's the senses, all your senses participate in every cultural activity. And that's what he's saying in that little scene. I don't know if this makes sense. <laughs> it, it does. I, just, I was just going to ask you for people who don't know the, the story. Actually, I started the book. I never finished it. But what I, the image from Don Quixote I have is that someone is with a sword and wants to fight windmills or something like that. Yeah, well, that's another stereotype about it. Yeah. Windmills <laughs> are the hallucination, right? It's he, he thinks that there are giants, enemies, and he starts to fight them. And in fact, there are windmills, and so he is the one who's crazy. Not so sure. Sometimes a windmill can be a nasty machine that hurts people. But that's not the issue. The issue is that he, um, he sees what he sees. He's willing and open to imagine, to let the imagination participate in what he sees. And then you make mistakes, and you hurt yourself and others, and... A lot of awful things can come out of that, but not only. Mm. There are also really good things that come out of it. And by by the way, all the films that we oh, sorry I say film again. This is this is an installation. Yes. Um, but uh, all the uh, works that we mention are available through your website, and I will uh, point readers to that. Uh, there's also uh, one one film that we will speak about later, which you can watch in full. So. For me, the challenge is always, okay, we, on the one hand, I want to do justice to the, to the creativity and the diversity and the openness. But on the other side, we need a kind of structure. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, uh, for, uh, I'm going to ask you about your, how you see Plato's cave, because given what we just talked about, uh, the stereotype of Western philosophy is perhaps Plato's cave. If you Google philosophy, 
that's probably what you find as one of the first things. If you if you take a philosophy course, that's probably one of the first stories. And we talked about already in a previous episode about the first reading is like a two world theory. You're in the where we're like in a, in an illusion now, and then we're freed, and then we go up to the sun, and that's it. And then we go back, and no one will believe us. Believe us, which I think um, uh, I'm looking for the word. What's the word if you if you think you're really great and no one will believe you, narcissism. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> narcissism. <laughs> it really, I mean, it really, who, who doesn't want to be the, the returning philosopher to the shadow realm who has seen the sun and, uh, but the people are too stupid to, to follow me. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, the first mistake this guy makes is that we all know that you cannot look into the sun. You can see it at a distance, but if you look into it, you go blind. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not that simple. But also, uh, yeah, I, I read that text in, in different ways. And one is it's a sort of an annoying binary opposition. The guys in the cave have nothing, can't even move their heads. And outside, they can do everything. And that freedom isn't quite realistic either. So I think the binary opposition... In fact, you said, uh, if I may return to something you said before, you said we need a structure. And that is absolutely true. And I have actually made uh, my first work, Narratology, was about structure. It was offering a structure. But what was that structure? It was not something that exists, but it's something that you can use, like a cloth hanger. You can use it to attach yourself to and to develop your thoughts and then make what you say in your thoughts and your um, interpretation, for example, you make, can make it available to others through that structure. That structure is the ground of discussion, of interdisciplinarity and of uh, uh, intersubjectivity, as it's called, that it gives some, um, yeah, some, some, uh, it, f- it makes it possible to say, I see it this way for this reason, and not just because I like it this way. And that reason is discussable. So someone else can say, well, I see it very differently. And this is my reason. And then you can put those reasons together and discuss them. And then you have a structural agreement or disagreement. That is structure. But Plato's cave is too absolute as a binary opposition, of course. And that's because it's an allegory. But there is also the guy who comes back, who has been outside. And uh, I mean, they are discussing, right? There are two guys discussing this. And the structure of the discourse is, what if? What if we go back? What if they say this? And what if? Well, what if is a wonderful sort of key phrase to come up with fiction and with the imagination. And I have used that a lot in in my film work, especially, uh, you know, like Descartes and Spinoza meet in my film. That never really happened. I mean, it's not likely. It could have happened, but uh, Spinoza would have mentioned it if it was the case. So I just assumed that it never happened. But I then think, what if they met? What if they had met? How would they discuss this of affect? And then when you look back at Descartes' work, and Descartes is the older one, so uh, Descartes is supposed to be the hyper-rationalist, and you know, people hate him for that. If you look back at the, uh, the autobiographical work, you see a lot of uh, affective issues come up that later in Spinoza become theorized. So I staged them together, in a, in a, uh, this is in a film, also an installation, but a film. I staged them together discussing. And Spinoza is the young man, the sort of, you know, uh, cocky young man who thinks he can correct the old master. And in fact, he does and he can. And Descartes accepts it because there is a what if, what if this is like that? And what if leads to an exciting discovery? So it, it leads to fiction and it leads to discovery. 
<laughs> and that I can see in the cave allegory also, this what if structure. Yeah, and, and but I re because I started reading the cave and I kind of combined different translations. I tried to kind of make it my own, but what I like is that in the end he says, if this uh, if it's true, only God knows, but this is how I see it. Yeah. And maybe that's what happens a lot, that there that you have people who say, What what if you look at it like this? Mm -hmm. And then somebody else comes and say, Plato has said, or Descartes has said, or so the, the interpreter, so to speak, because yeah. so, so somebody uh has an uh, it's an act of imagination or creativity or kind of like what children do what if what if uh, we're a prince and princess or what if we are two princes uh, what if two well, instead of a prince and a princess two princes get married yeah. hey, nice. no, no problem but then yeah so that's what i like about because descartes is one of the people that you that you also get in your education if you read about Descartes it's maybe similar to to what you read about Plato is about okay this is what Descartes said yeah but then if you actually go to the like one of the th things that surprises people if they start to read the text that he doesn't uh, just speak about uh, a mind and, and a world but uh, for him this can only be there if we assume that there is a God and that those two are in the mind of God. Mm. Yeah. And there are so many other uh, ways in which you, I think in your film really challenge uh, what that we think we, we know what, what kind of person was this, what did he say, what did he mean? Yeah, well, Descartes is a bit the bad guy now of yeah. modernity. Everybody thinks that he is obsolete because, uh, you know, we are post-Cartesian. That post, the, if there's one word in language that I hate, is that post, because it always suggests that you can leave behind, that we are more advanced, developed, etc., and everything before is, is obsolete. And that is a, a, such a serious mistake. And of course, if you take Descartes' thesis, his explicit uh, so-called uh, opinions too literally and too rigidly, there is a lot there that we don't agree with anymore. But if you consider how he did his thinking and, and what's, what's between the lines, then it becomes much more uh, important. And then I think we are actually pre-Cartesian in a sense. Pre-Cartesian. Yeah, pre-Cartesian, because we don't see uh, the things that he actually uh, proposed and offered and demonstrated. Hmm. And the one, the one example that I put forward as a sort of provocation is to say that he invented psychoanalysis. And of course, he never used the word, he never did, he never, you know, never, never, never. But if you read his correspondence with the Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia, who was, uh, you know, the daughter of a one-season king who was chased out of... Uh, of the uh, city and the country and sent back to where he came from. And this daughter who had a lot of, she had siblings, she was young and she got um, a sort of an illness called the sort of, the what's called whole, some sort of fever, cold fever or something. I don't remember the title, but this woman got a chronic, chronic disease and she said, no doctor can help me. No one knows what it is. And then the card, and this was all by correspondence huh? because they, they didn't meet. Uh, they met once or so. But then he wrote, look in the face what's happening and do this, do that. And it helped. So how could that happen? Because he understood what was going on. And he understood that she had been traumatized, that it was a psychic illness, not a physical one. It was a consequence of a psychic illness and he helped her out of it. Now that is uh, a psychoanalytic approach and this has been seen by others also. But what I find interesting is that it is, we would say now it's pre-Freudian because he lived before Freud and he doesn't do the clinical approach that is the 
the classical psychoanalysis. And I say boldly, he's post-Freudian in his view, because uh, there is a post-Freudian school in psychoanalysis now that's much more socially oriented and where solidarity is an important element that helps the cure. And this was a, a gesture of solidarity. He saw that she was traumatized because he was. And that is an amazing, um, it's an interpretation that of course I cannot prove and no psychoanalyst will accept it, but I still believe in it. This is a very nice way in which your works also talk to each other because you, you made another film called The Long History of Madness. Yes. And there someone said, madness reverses time. You're, you're now reversing what people say post or pre. Yes. And one of the things that I got of it out of it is that we, in our society, we tend to put people either in boxes by placing a label or them or in, in, in institutions. If you are mad, then you, you must go to a doctor or a hospital or you get this label. Uh, someone, I have to quote here, someone says, even with someone who is very mad, you must find the right chord. So it's a nice musical metaphor, but it's one of my colleagues uh, is a seasoned psychoanalyst. And that's what I remember him always saying. He says, I, it doesn't matter. I, I reach people, give me time. Sometimes he starts to, literally, he starts to, uh, he told me about the breakthrough he had with one patient where he, he just tried to find out how can I reach this person? The person didn't say anything, didn't look at him. At one point he started, he got his guitar and he started playing Beatles songs. <laughs> he started to sing with him. Yeah, yeah. Well, in the, in the Madness film that you just mentioned, there is a scene, and that's where the chord comes in, uh, about uh, striking the right chord. She is talking with um, a man who is a restorer of, uh, how do you call those instruments? Harpsichord, harpsichord. And he, he says this, or she says this, but there is a discussion about striking the right chord. And that's what music is, too. Music requires that. But between people also. So that makes total sense, yes. And what is the role of recognition in this? Oh, in everything. Uh, this is a really good word that you bring up. I think that the encounter with other people, with artworks, with uh, cultural artifacts, with everything, is a combination, must be a combination of recognition and discovery. If you don't recognize anything, you have no common ground. So you have no possibility of making sense of something. If you have only discovery, you go wild and you have no check and there is nothing that will tell you this is right or this is not quite right. Um, so that is also not a good idea. That the engagement with the encounter with art, for example, and with literature and with everything that you study from the world, from the concrete world, is a, basically a combination, uh, an integration has to be between discovery and recognition. And this is something that I have learned to appreciate when I was doing work on, I think it was in Quoting Caravaggio, my book that's on an old master and contemporary art. And that's where I developed the idea of going back and forth between past and present. And then I started to read again, uh, Walter Benjamin's thesis on the philosophy of history. And there he says something like, I quote by heart, so I don't know if it's exact. Um, Every image that is not recognized by the present as one of its own concerns will disappear irretrievably. Every mm. image from the past, he says, that is not recognized by the present as one of its own concerns will disappear irretrievably. So that the past is relevant for now. And if not, you lose it. And I found that a very important uh, statement. But that's based on recognition. It has to be recognized as such. And recognition is not only seeing what you already know, but it is also 
this aha yes i know this i knew this but i forgot and mm -hmm. you see it again and you discover other aspects that's also recognition it's also a social attitude to recognize someone's merits someone's um, you know good characters and uh, other people um recognizing for example if you encounter someone that you think is from a completely different world than you and then you start to talk and you recognize things yeah. in, in uh, that come up as yes i know this too so recognition is as valuable and as crucial as discovery hmm. it reminds me of this song by sting when he, he sings uh, the russians love their children too <laughs> this was during the cold war that's exactly the kind of thing <laughs> yeah it's a, so i i have so many recognitions now but I thought, okay, to to uh, maybe we could do an experiment where in last in the last episode, I thought, okay, I will use Plato's allegory of the cave and the different stages in the cave, and we'll go through it. But instead, I propose we use your uh, exhibition, which mm -hmm. I visited, and it's still ongoing. But by the time this podcast will be released, it's not at least there in the it's it's in the past. It's not there anymore in the museum uh, Jan Kulen in mm -hmm. Os, which. I hope it will be repeated. But the book is still uh, there. The book, you wrote a book called Art Out of Necessity. Yeah. And actually, the, there are so many books and films connected to this exhibition. Yeah, so here I would start to describe what is your ex exhibition about, what is it, and then would, I would maybe ask you what it is about. But probably, uh, if you could answer that question, you would not have needed to create it. And right, exactly. If I could get what I wanted to get from it, then I probably wouldn't uh, have needed to go there. So it's like we, we now share a secret and um, the, the people listening to this, they also have a secret because we don't know who they are and we don't know what they are interested in. Yeah. But what we could do is uh, maybe just just a few, I, I call them chambers, because that's how, how it felt for me, sp different spaces in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. And we, we could go uh, through them. Yeah. First, the title was Art Out of Necessity. Yes. And I think, well, we, we both live in the Netherlands. Let's say that the culture or that the conversations about art uh, that are ongoing are not that art is necessary or even uh, urgent. No, no, there is always this idea that has been brought into the discourse, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago or something. Uh, art is a leftist hobby. So it's a hobby, it's superfluous, you don't need mm -hmm. it. And it's, it's on the left, which is a crazy way of boxing it in again because it wants to make people think doesn't mean that it's that you have to be on the left you can be and i am but that is not uh, i'm i don't believe in the sort of right and left division as i don't believe in the dark and, and bright division, uh, division in in plato's cave but the uh, Art out of necessity is a plea for the importance of art beyond just liking it. I think, of course, if you like it, so much the better. What's wrong with pleasure? But it is not only, uh, or the pleasure is not only uh, just fun. It's also that you the excitement of seeing something that you didn't know, and you know, all sorts of different ways in which art can become. Um, it's like food. I see art as a as a kind of food. I think if art disappears, life goes out of society. Mm -hmm. But then you are not just talking about paintings of Rembrandt and no. uh, the let's say what the, the high art. Yeah. That I think. Uh, well, I personally I I don't know much about like that kind of art. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But that's kind of the image there. The art is in museums. And uh, I can go to the Rijksmuseum in the Netherlands and look at the Nachtwacht, the, the night watch, mm -hmm. and just appreciate how he played with light and dark and how realistic the figures are and how old the painting is and how big and 
how many people are like taking selfies uh, of it. But of course, I have to rush because. Just as an aside, I, you 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 are also a curator, so I'm just imagining. Okay, the and, and just take any uh, famous painting, the Mona Lisa. Uh, I probably now with Corona, it's probably impossible. But I think you can, if you if you go there, you maybe can spend ten minutes there or something, and uh, you have to reserve in time slots, and there will be many different people. Mm-hmm. But I remember something you did in an exhibition which you curated. Uh, where people were kind of not forced to sit, but they were invited. Uh. Oh, yeah, that's the exhibition in the Munk Museum uh, in Oslo uh, that I did in 2017. That was the the greatest joy I could have, to be invited to curate an exhibition out of the, the 1,200 uh, paintings and, and thousands of drawings and, and etchings and, and great things of a great artist, a great modern artist. And at the same time, they invited me to include in the exhibition our video work, Madame B, that you have seen in, in us also. And, uh, but then the larger version of 20 screens, not five. So... And I had the whole museum at my uh, disposal. And then when I said, shall we do a catalog? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then at some point I said, shouldn't we talk about the catalog? And they said, well, actually. And I thought, oh, my God, he's not going to want a catalog. He said, I don't want a catalog. I want a book. (laughs) And I asked what the difference was. He said, a serious study of what you did and of these works. And that's the one that I did um, that's called Emma and Edward. And uh, there uh, I I can tell you the anecdote, how this happened. I was worried that there was a a discrepancy between the still paintings and the videos. Because in terms of time, videos take time. And paintings on the wall, you know, you can walk past. And this is what people do in museums. They walk past and after half an hour, you're exhausted. And so I said, let's do seating and put the paintings low so that when you sit, you look the paintings in the eyes. So the the paintings are on the eye level of the seated viewer, visitor, not the standing and walking one. And so this happened and it was like a revolution. And it was, you know, it was an incredible success also, even in the national press. But it was also, for me, the success was to see a teenager, a 14-year-old or something, sit for like 20 minutes in front of a painting. And then I was called away for a meeting. And an hour later, I came back and the same teenager was sitting three benches further. So she had gone on and on spending time with the works. And that was the way a way of seeing the paintings of this fantastic artist, but they are not easy. They are complex. They have very many layers of meaning and of effect and all that. But if you sit there and let it come to you, you can discover so many things. There was even an artist who had been seeing all the Munch exhibitions for 20 years. She lived in Oslo. And she said, you know, that painting was a particular painting called The Kiss, actually. Uh, the, The Kiss, I've seen The Kiss so often because it's in almost all the exhibitions. It's one of the, you know, the classical masterpieces. And I never saw that little man there outside. And that changes the whole thing, changes everything. Yes, because I had put a bench in front of the painting. And so she'd been sitting there and saw it. And that was a wonderful experience, really wonderful. That's uh, actually one of the reasons why maybe I don't go to museums. I had this uh, I had this experience in Madrid. I was only there for a couple of days and I went to the, I don't know what it's called. It's the La Granica and I really love Dali. And, but I've, I'd only ever seen like uh, uh, on the computer screens or like posters of Dali. Yeah. So I wanted to see his paintings. And um, so I went into the museum. I walked past the Granica, La Granica. Mm-hmm. 
maybe one of the greatest works i don't know <laughs> modern art yeah absolutely i just walked past it because i had to i wanted to see dali i thought okay i'll come back there later but then i i, I went past dali's paintings and i only got halfway because i i came to the invisible man mm. and i just i stood there for uh i think three hours or something oh my god yeah and and after that, I was exhausted and I don't know what happened. I cannot describe it, but it was like a little bit, like you say, I was like, it was like I'm watching a movie. Yeah. 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 But also because I was also the director, because sometimes I'm, I was moving closer to, to a detail. But when you move closer to a detail, you don't, you don't see the whole painting anymore. No. And then you move away and you see, well, yeah, there's a, there's a, in, there's a man in the painting. Actually, is there a man in the painting? It's a question because it's just composition because there's like a little windmill there. That's his eye. Mm. So it was very mixed feeling because I, I had to leave the museum after that. And I really, I think if I stayed there a, a month or something, I could be, go back after a month. But mm. it was on the one hand, a feeling of, wow, this was incredible. On the other hand, I'm missing out on La Guernica and all yeah. the other uh, yeah. works in the museum. Yeah, and the Guernica is a good example, especially since when you walk past it, it's on the left, uh, you see it in the wrong in the wrong order. It was seen from the other side. It was designed because it was designed for the other wall in the uh, uh, Universal Exhibition. And so now they have actually adjusted that and made a wall so that you have to go around and turn back. And then mm. you see it in the right way. It's really, uh, is it in the Reina Sofia or in the Prado? I don't remember. Anyway, um, those are the two great museums in, in Madrid. But yeah. uh, the, the, the problem is, if you look at the Prado and those big museums, what do you, what do you expect that people can endure? It's impossible. You stand for more than half an hour when you're a certain age or when you have uh, bad knees or whatever you cannot and so you are forced to rush yeah. and to just uh, mentally check off of see this 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 i've seen it all and you can yeah. say i have seen these and i wanted people to to not have that effect with monk but to get to know him to get to know the works and mm. to discover them so you recognize and you discover again. Here we go again. And this, uh, the seating was an absolutely crucial element. Now, in the museum that my exhibition is now, it's a different situation. One of the reasons I wanted this for Munch was also to, to, to establish an equality, a sort of democratic equality between the videos and the, and the paintings that people would not uh, go fast by the monks and then sit down for the for the videos. So mm -hmm. sitting all in, in us now, you have to because it's all videos, um, most of it. Uh, but now for me, it's almost a dogma. When I curate their seating, and that has to happen. And with the Don Quixote, uh, I've had the Don Quixote in uh, in Sweden, in Spain, in the United Kingdom, and every time, I, first thing I say, I'm happy to exhibit this here, but here's my condition, seating. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, it was a bit difficult. I said, well, go and scout for seating, ask your colleagues if they don't have a place somewhere, and even this messy arrangement of chairs, as long as people can sit. Yeah, take, take your time. Yeah, no, take your time. Give your time. <laughs> so, but we we are in your exhibition now. So the yeah. the okay. title out of out of necessity. Yes. So I went up to the first floor and uh, I saw this beautiful portrait, which uh, I will share a link in the description. It's a, a, a photograph of you, <laughs> and it was really nice to. I didn't expect it, and it's kind of when you just come up and you you turn you 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 still don't have the feeling i'm in the exhibition you you wonder when is it going to start and then you have this well people can look on the side but you look in a way i think okay it's it started i'm in your kingdom now <laughs> and of course because being busy with plato's cave i thought okay <clears throat> i'm in this i'm going to take this journey now yeah yeah <laughs> 
it's true. It was, and then, it's, uh, what I thought, okay, out of not out of necessity, what I would expect is that I'm going to look at those uh, works and then taking my time and art being art at the end in the car ride home, I'm going to have to reflect on what, okay, what is the necessity uh, of, of art? But instead, the first, in the main hall, the first film on display is, uh, it's about time. And on the wall, it says urgency. So everything in that room screams for, this is necessary, this is urgent. And so this, this film actually is, it's a video essay. It's only about 30 minutes long and it's available on your website. I really encourage people to to maybe pause pause this recording, go look at it, and come back because uh, <laughs> I mean it's such an incredible film and what what an amazing uh, actress. I think her name is Ma Magdalena. Magdalena uh, Sack. Yeah. There are several Magdalenas involved, but I think she's Magdalena Sack. The main, Ma Magdalena Sack. Yeah. i probably we will hear more from her, but yeah. so. Um, and the guy is also fantastic. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And well, uh, uh, did I mention it before? The, the guy playing Don Quixote, and yeah. the, well, you, you know how to pick. Uh, I know how to pick people. Yeah. I do yeah. know how to cast. I I know. Although the people mm. that haven't had been pre-selected by um, uh, by uh, the the local producer who is the director of the program that invited me but yeah. basically it's um uh i have a sense of uh, it's not only what they look like absolutely not also not only that they can act although i they have to be good actors but it's also people who are dialogic so we discuss the film we discuss each scene before and after. That's normal, but main, mainly when you have a big, you know, famous uh, film director, they sit on the director's chair and do it again, do it again, this is not good, and then at, at the end of the day, there are two minutes uh, done. And I do not um, feel that sense of authority. I don't like it, I don't have the authority because I, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm as much an amateur as everybody else. And I also find that in the dialogue, in the discussion, if you let the people come up with their ideas and say, okay, try it, you know, in the uh, Madame B, there's the same guy, who, the same guy who plays Don Quixote, Don Quixote is also the pharmacist in Madame B. And he, so it's a sort of secondary role, but still a big role. And he came up with improvisations. He, we were somewhere, we had filmed, he said, listen, I'm not quite satisfied. I would like to add a little thing here. Can I make an improvisation? And I said, yes, you can. And then we film it. And if I like it, I put it in. And if, if it doesn't fit, then I don't. And so... Um, it, Every bit he improvised is in the film because it, mm. he was just so good in it. And the others also, they're they are just very good, especially in the improvisations. Yeah. It's really interesting. I do have a nose for picking the right people, I must say. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This, this this film um, the, the the it features uh, Cassandra and like in most of your films the time is kind of all messed up. There's people maybe from, from the past walking in present day and, and they're speaking different languages. They're, that So that, that makes it very interesting in itself. But what I found interesting is that this film was finished just before the corona pandemic. And Cassandra is uh, a figure from Greek mythology who mm -hmm. got the gift of predicting the future, seeing the future. And the curse of never being believed. Yeah, and you know why, huh? Sorry? You know why she got the curse? She refused the sexual harassment of Apollo. Apollo, yeah. <laughs> it was a, a Me Too situation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway. So she was punished for... Uh, for refusing to sleep with him. 
Exactly. And it cost the world because that this is in, I think she predicted the fall of Troy. Mm. So it cost the world something that, that she was refused her. Well, we can get into a whole story about uh, <laughs> Me Too and yeah. the way women and feminist, femininity is uh, seen in this world. But um, you also, well, actually, you make the connection with uh, Greta Thunberg. Yeah. Well, she's trying to, to warn us now for the imminent disaster. And do we really listen to her? You say, how cute that a school, a school girl is so that We love it. But nothing changes. Or not enough. And what do you mean in the film, there's a phrase, the virus of chronology? <laughs> <laughs> That was a little bit of a, a nasty wordplay, <laughs> the virus of chronology. Chronology is a virus in the intellectual sense, in the sense that you cannot escape it. There's no way it will ever be accepted in the, in the humanities, in the sciences, and uh, I, I guess everywhere in philosophy. There is a chronology that's always like a line. Mm -hmm. And in, uh, and so I call it the virus of chronology in the film as, as a little joke because Corona was already coming up and, you know, we knew it was coming. But it's also, I, I'm re I, I mean it also in a sense that the chronology is impossible to avoid because everybody believes in it. And if you just imagine that the, the metaphor for time is an arrow, Right, it's a line, an arrow in the past from the present yeah. to the future. Yeah, yeah. If you just imagine a different metaphor for time, then everything becomes different. I've done that in image thinking in the book. I've come up with the uh, octopus hmm. metaphor for time. And well, I won't go into it, but it's going to be really exciting to see how people respond to that, to the idea that the tentacles, the eight tentacles are different aspects of time, different sh short duration, long duration, rhythm, uh, and then also chronology, but also the reverse of chronology, which is what I try to develop in the book on Caravaggio and Contemporary Art is the reversed chronology that we cannot see Caravaggio without seeing it through the eyes, through the images, the screens of contemporary art, because that's our world, our visual, our discourse, visual discourse. And so you have to accept that the past is not what it was when it was made. It is what it is now. Yeah. And it's very for, easy for me to say, well, that's preposterous. Yes, that's a very good way of saying it. It is preposterous. And of course, that's the joke. I like to make jokes in my work. Huh? Little puns and like the, the virus of chronology. Uh, preposterous, it, it was a way of saying pre and post reverse places. So it's the idea that the, the we usually think of the past inf uh, influencing the future, but the future also influences the past or the present, should I yes. say the present? Yes, that's what, I, that's what I want to argue with that term. And then it's also with a wink in the sense that we all know that preposterous also means absurd and how dare you? Well, how dare you, they can say to me, I don't mind. <laughs> but I don't think it's ridiculous. Read no. the book and see what I do with Caravaggio through contemporary art, and you see that it does change. Hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting that in uh, in the, uh, a short, uh, a long history of time, somebody says uh, madness reverses time. Long history and, of madness, you mean? Yeah, long history <laughs> of madness. Yeah, <laughs> somebody says uh, yeah. madness reverses time. Yeah, and well. Actually, I think in Plato's cave, of course, Plato is writing, okay, the, the, the prisoner comes back into the cave and they, he tries to free the people, but they want to kill him. Yeah. Uh, of course, he's thinking about uh, his teacher, Socrates, who, who was one of the, or I, I say, of course, but that's my interpretation, who was, uh, who was killed for 
speaking the truth, at least as, as he yeah. said it. And yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Actually, the woman who is saying that, that madness reverses time, is herself a psychoanalyst of madness. Mm -hmm. She she's plays her own character. Because yeah. she, she wrote the book on which the film is based. And so I asked her, would you like to play? She said, I've never played. I've never been in front of a camera. And I said, let's try it. And then she did fantastic. So I said, you do it if you want. And and so that's how it happened. Yeah. See, this is this little talent I have for casting. I huh. saw that she could do it because she has some sort of total honesty, sincerity, and at the same time, she's smart and she can laugh and she makes jokes and she is absolutely in solidarity with her patients in, in a sense that helps them. So I saw this as a good character to play that role and mm. that's how it happened. So with this idea of reversal of time and yes. beating time, I went into the, the second uh, chamber. Yeah. Where there was actually the uh, an installation with reasonable doubt, which we discussed Descartes yeah. a little bit before already. Yes. And I was reading how you write about madness. Mm. And uh, what I find is interesting is that a lot of your work is about concepts and uh, maybe uh, like something like preposterous or image thinking or coming up with concepts that that have a productive force and they give something. Yeah, they give us something to uh, to uh, the phenomenon. Yeah. But it looks like with madness, you're doing the reverse because you're saying that, uh, wait, I have the book here. I'm translating from the Dutch. You say madness is kind of like a badge of honor. So you use madness, which is kind of a colloquial term uh, instead of diagnostic terms like yeah. psychosis, schizophrenia, uh, mental disorder. And I think now in, there's, there's a deb debate in society about uh, giving attention to mental health, mm. which I think is good. It's like a way of saying, okay, it's, it's just because you are diagnosed as being depressed or whatever it is, or on the autistic spectrum doesn't mean that you cannot function. Yeah, exactly. That's why we use madness as a sort of generic term yeah. for people with issues that makes them make them different from the traditional one-liner yeah. kind of people. And I think you can learn from those people. Instead of turning a corner to avoid meeting them, you mm -hmm. can learn because they have the, a sort of a directness or a metaphor that you wouldn't have thought of. Or, you know, if we just accept that people are people, whatever their mental state, their intelligence, their talents, all that, then you can learn from everyone and also from the mad. Yeah. I think it's a very nice contrast where I think, especially in the United States, where there is this political correctness dialogue about what you can call people. So if you would say someone that... Uh, you would be, uh, let's say, cancelled if you would say uh, someone with a mental disorder is mad. But yeah, I guess I guess they would say that you're not politically correct if you say that. But mm -hmm. they would say uh, mentally challenged, right? Yes. Because it has to be it has to be precise and it has to also be euphemistic. It's a euphemism. Mm -hmm. Like people are challenged in all sorts of ways. And uh, the mentally challenged, I prefer to call them mad because that makes it possible uh, to not put them in those boxes that lead to uh, uh, the medication that makes zombies out of them. Not always and not every, I'm not against medication totally, but I am very wary of uh, thinking if you give people pills, you don't have to worry about them anymore. And maybe they went mad because they're lonely or they are, you know, not believed or, or they have been abused, mm -hmm. right? traumatized. And if you just would listen and take them seriously enough to do that, then uh, you get a very different view and you learn new things. 
And that's so interesting about, I notice I say, <laughs> I notice I say interesting a lot. And I remember yeah. that in <laughs> doctor analysis, you, you told me, so I haven't learned anything. You told me don't say interesting, but I, I've tried to remember why, but. Well, because it is a meaningless word. Yeah. Uh, it's, it says that it's gripping. Interesting is gripping. You want you you go there because it's not indifferent. It's the opposite of indifference. Mm -hmm. But it is basically a meaningless word. I think I would like something more specific. I would like to, if you say your exhibition is interesting, I would say, okay, where do we go from there? What what is interesting? What mm. what do you want to I say? It can be interesting depending on how you look at it. Yeah, I think interesting is just meaningless. It's not a bad word, it's just meaningless. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you what I want. I wanted to make a transition mm -hmm. and then maybe you can show me how I could make this in another way rather than saying interesting. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to go, we were speaking about madness and madness being a badge of honor and, uh, and, and everything like that. Uh, I wanted to make a connection with the Descartes film because mm -hmm. um, I read an article uh, that was saying something like, oh, do you know the geniuses in history like uh, Newton and De Descartes wasn't mentioned, but people like Newton and Einstein, mm -hmm. even they were a little bit mad because uh, Newton was into alchemy and this person was into, the and I was thinking, well, how do you know? It was presented as, okay, they were doing this, and despite their uh, little bit madness. But well, I, I was thinking maybe it was, it was because of that. That's exactly, yeah. Before we get into that, how, how can I make this transition other than saying, well, this is interesting because... Well, you, say, you pick whatever word you want, or you just don't say this is this, you just ask the next question and my answer immediately while you were saying this that Einstein and, and Newton and absolutely Descartes they were the geniuses they were because they did not have the limitations of the rationality that uh, is very helpful but also confining and Descartes is at his most uh, gripping his most engaging when he becomes a little hysterical. Because then, I, I know there is this anecdote that he had a friend, an early friend, and he his first writing was about music. He wrote that in Latin. And he gave it to this friend for a Christmas or a New Year's present. And he said, but don't show it to anyone else. And the guy was so taken by it that he did talk about it to other people. And Descartes heard that and became furious. Now, in the Descartes uh, scholarship, people think that he overreacted, uh, that he was hysterical, and that he was unpleasant. And you can think all those things. I don't mind. Of course, it was a bit hysterical. But, hey, he was actually doing, um, yeah, acknowledging in a sense that uh, the writing had to be read by others. He, he ended up accepting it. So um, I, I would say that the madness is part of the intelligence and that's because it is more open than the pure rationality. And that mm. openness allows for detours and, and also novelty. So if if uh, if we are lacking a little madness in ourselves, maybe we should speak and listen to uh, other people that are labeled as such. And, uh... Yeah, well, yeah, I I think that the way that I uh, interpreted it and staged it in the film, in Descartes' case, is that was always related to social issues, and his so his he was socially a bit clumsy. And that has to do with having been traumatized, having been, you know, basically abandoned by his parents, the mother that I left, and, you know, and that abandonment complex, which is a recognized complex in psychoanalysis, the abandonment complex 
makes it impossible for people later on in life to uh, form attachments because they're afraid that they will be abandoned again. And so they prefer to be the, 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 the one who abandons. And that is a very um, important insight that a certain madness helps us realize. And I think that in Descartes' case, you know, his very failed relationship to that queen that he met right before he died was a good example. And many of his friends, do you know that it took until 2008 for the University of Utrecht to lift the ban on Descartes? <laughs> this is a joke, right? No, it's real. No. Maybe it was 2006. That's possible that I missed. Oh, then that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that is okay. But so he, instead of discussing with him, he was banned because he wasn't religiously orthodox, and he so he was basically his badness, his his so-called bad character, is more to do with his un unorthodox wildness. Mm -hmm. than with an hyper-rationality that we attribute to him. No. And he, in the film he speaks with Spinoza, who yeah. was also banned in various ways. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. But that was for, yeah, that was a just uh, issue. But, but in Descartes' case also, basically, these guys are never orthodox enough. And that makes them great. Okay, so then I went into the next chamber and the first film I saw is actually, it's a documentary and I think it's my favorite film that you made and it's called Becoming Vera. Mm. And it's about a girl, I think she's three years old or four years oh, old three. in the film. From three to four, yeah. Yeah, and she, you, you just see her, she, uh, you see her going to Cameroon where she has some uh, ceremony because she is the descendant of, of a lineage of princes and she's actually the first girl and she's also mixed, uh, which is mentioned. Uh, then she goes to Paris because her her mother and they, they live there, but she also goes to Russia and she's travel, traveling the whole world. Well, actually, she doesn't just travel the world. Those are the three places. The father yeah. is from Cameroon, the mother is from Russia and they live in yeah. Paris. Yeah, what, so what struck me in the film is I actually I watched it with my wife and I asked her what she what she thought about it and she said well it's it really made her uncomfortable because you you see this girl and everybody is telling her who she is mm. so she's in um, Cameroon and somebody's telling her but you are Bamuk or Bamut I think. Uh, Bamun. Bamun is the, Bamun. Yeah. the language. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and then she's going in, in Russia, she's in an Orthodox church, and she has to do something like touch her head to a sacred scripture or something like that. Yeah. And yeah, so it raised for me the question, who, who tells us who we are? Yeah, that's a, it's a great point, and your wife is totally right, except that instead of making it, her uncomfortable, the way to learn from this child, from this film, but from the child basically, is that you also see the resistance against that identification as this or that. And that resistance is fiction. She comes up with fictional stories that she's learned also from the books and from the, from the school. But she, uh, the, there's this one scene that I love where she's sitting on her father's knee and she, she tells her father that she has seen a witch this morning and her head flew away and she tells a story about the witch. And then the father says, oh, like Snow White? And that is putting it down to something he knows. The, the recognition takes over. Mm -hmm. And that's something he knows is actually against him because he is black and, and Snow White is about Snow White, about Snow Whiteness. But... The girl, she looks at him, she looks to the side, and then she says, after a bit of silence, and that silence is precious, it tells us that she's thinking. She says, you have to look at the story with me. I invented it. The witch had colored hair <laughs> in all sorts of colors. So she takes fiction, a, a well-known story, 
brings it into her own orbit, like the, the you know the, the 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 wild hair and all sorts of colors, and and she corrects her father by claiming her position as what in narrative theory focalizer story is told through her eyes. She gives shape to that story. And so the father is simply set straight by the three-year-old. Yeah. And I love that moment. And then later on in Russia, when she's, her mother is from Russia, uh, descended from Russia, she, she was born in, in uh, I think, in France. But um, the mother uh, takes her to her background. And there she is walking in a sort of a palace. And you see this little fat finger of a three-year-old pointing to a painting. And what's she pointing at? The one black man, the black mm. servant in this 17th century painting. You know, you know how it is. These are royalties and you know, princes, princesses, but then there is always a servant who's black. And she, she doesn't say anything. She points to him. Mm. And so that is a way in which she, she just claims to get out of the stereotyping. It's, uh, and there are several moments where she tells stories, where she d- does things that are uh, amazingly productive as yeah. fiction. And so you, you can console your wife and say, see it again <laughs> and look at the resistance. Yeah, because we, we kept on watching it. I think so. Speaking of taking the time to, to uh, look at art or to experience art. Yeah. Maybe one of the most important things, maybe that if you feel uncomfortable, yeah. if you were watching a movie on TV, you would change the channel. Yes. But actually, we kept on watching. That's good. Good. Uh, later, the mother uh, of Vera says, it's not necessary to have a clear identity. Yeah. And we actually had a very, I, I would like to print this, you know, along everywhere in the world. It's not necessary to have a clear identity. And yeah. Uh, we actually had a nice conversation about because our daughter, so my wife is Thai and uh, mm-hmm. I'm Dutch, and we had a nice conversation about we that she doesn't need to. We don't have. We're never going going to tell her you are this, you are that, and uh, uh, or, or try to do things like that. And yeah. she, yeah. So it led to a very nice conversation. And then, yeah. if I think back of when I sat in the in the, watching that movie, I looked to my left and there's this photograph uh, which made me feel very uncomfortable because it's by a photographer who makes photographs of um, uh, like the the places where refugees spend the night. Yeah, Hank Wilshut. Yeah, he makes yeah. beautiful images of something ugly. And they've left and they're still like a kind of a tent or something. You can see they yeah. really put a lot of effort in there. And I say, well, what would I do if I, if instead of being so lucky, like living here, uh, if I would be forced to go with my family somewhere, yeah. I would make, uh, try to make the best house or pen tent or whatever that night, uh, maybe even make some art in there for my daughter to enjoy. <laughs> right, exactly. For me, that that really, uh, I felt the urgency of, of art, but it was not a pleasant feeling, I have to say. <laughs> No, but why would it always have to be pleasant? I think in the end, after that adventure, after seeing that film, seeing that your wife had an unco- a discomfort with it, uh, seeing, you know, what's my daughter going to see here? How old is your daughter? Three years old. Three. So the age of this child. <laughs> it's actually the favorite film of a lot of my friends who have young children <laughs> because mm-hmm. of, the, of this. But uh, because the a main character who is a child, a girl, and of mixed ethnicity, makes could make her into a total nothing. And instead, she's the mistress of the film. And that uh, that resistance she has against everything that is telling her who she is, like the hair. Have you seen that? The way that there's constantly they're fussing about her hair because she's yeah. half African, but her hair somehow is golden, yeah, not black. But it is African hair. It has the, the sort of the curls of, of African hair, but it's not black. So everybody's fussing about her hair, and she gets upset with that. 
And then when she's in the Pushkin uh, Museum, which is, there's a whole story about the, her mother, her mother's ancestors having been neighbors of the Pushkin family. Um, there is a bust of Pushkin in the museum with uh, curly hair and, you know, clearly African features, but it's a white marble bust. Okay, no problem. But the girl, Vera, had just had, for the first time, she had her hair in bunches. It's very nice, you know, it's a nice way of, of, uh, of making that hair into something really stylish. And so she says to her mother, he should have his hair done. Because she, what she sees is not an African man, but she sees he has the sort of hair that you could do in those bunches. And she, so she's being a bit naughty, yeah. telling him what to do, but it's also very sweet and lovely and makes you think. Yeah. And that's the whole point, even if it's not a pleasant feeling, as you say. It makes you think, but it makes you, uh, the thinking and the feeling and the being there and the images, they cannot be separated. No, exactly. So even, even a feeling that's not pleasant cannot be separated from images that you find beautiful. Well, the uh, Wilschut uh, photographs of the tents of the refugees is a good example. It's horrible when you think you have to live there, but it's a beautiful <laughs> photograph. Mm. And that is what art can uh, contribute. It can make things in the world present them in a way that shows the ugliness and the beauty at the same time. And I think that's why I wanted those photos there, because I selected the photos from the permanent collection that they mm -hmm. asked me if I would like to incorporate some of those. And I did, and I found that very exciting in that particular space with the two films about Ill illegal, the one about the, uh, no, there's no illegals in the, in the, uh, documentaries. There are two documentaries. One is a mother talking yeah. to her son who has emigrated, and the other is about this little girl. Yeah. And uh, in that room, I wanted these these photographs because of because of that paradox of that contradiction almost between beautiful and ugly. And we make the world uglier than it has to be. It has beauty, and yet. What do we do with it? So Mika, I want to thank you very much for this conversation and ask you to, to do maybe one last thing. Can you give us some homework? Some What is one thing that we can do if, uh, so the next episode will be about film. So the ne next film I'm going to watch, but, yeah. or the next artwork, or what is something that we can do to, to kind of bring into practice what we talked about? Well, I think it is really important, first of all, to engage with culture um, and not only be focused on your everyday work, your salary and you know, all the material things, but to take time, to give time to art. And some of that can be great art and some can be sort of, you know, Hollywood or Bollywood films, or uh, it's not about the greatest filmmakers have to be constantly watched. I think it's a mode of looking, it's an attitude that uh, I wish people would uh, sort of cultivate in themselves. First of all, to take the time and to um, uh, give the time, and that time is taken away from the everyday life, the, the making money, the, all those things. And that is an enrichment. To not spend all your time with efficiency, but to also waste time in that sense with uh, doing, um, you know, engaging with images and text and all that. And, and then do that combination, that integration of uh, recognition and discovery and say, wow, yes, that's an idea. The way you would say when a f you're sitting with a friend, you're having a drink, and you have different opinions. And then if you take the time, because you're friends, you each bring out your uh, your views, your 
treatments. And then in the end, you say, damn, yes, you are right. There is something there. And that is the moment that you have learned something, that you have enriched yourself. And I think that's the most important way of spending your life is to constantly learn from the world, from each other, from art, uh, how to get into new ideas, how to get new ideas, novelty. But novelty is never only new. It always has to have a connection to past things. Otherwise, you can't recognize it, so you can't make sense of it. So it's always that combination. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions about what we discussed, let me know. One more thing before I go. Mieke is an independent filmmaker and always working on her next project. One of the best ways to support her work is to go to her website, find a film or book that you like and order it. Like I said before, It's About Time is available in full, for free, but I recommend all of the films that we spoke about today. I hope to see you again next month. We will speak about film in more depth. Do you ever have the feeling that your life is like a film? Me too. That's what we'll speak about. <laughs>